Okay, is there? So. Okay, the volume is what the channel is. Muted. Okay, Chris. Thanks, Hafran. And thanks, uh, thanks, um, conference host, for inviting me to uh, to talk today, and also for Hafran uh, as well, hosting at Reykjavik. Um, it's uh, it's a great opportunity. I, I love talking about the or two of my most favourite areas, which are around psychological development of young people and parents. And most of my um, research over the past uh, 25 years now has been uh, driven in those in those areas. And uh, it's nice to go last before the morning because it gives me a chance to really bring together um, the messages and the concepts and the experiences that everyone has um, already spoken about because there's so many different things from each of the presenters that I'll hopefully be able to um, reinforce again today and also um, try to show the degree of, of, of congruence and, uh, and similarity and shared thinking that exists uh, amongst all the presenters um, you know, here. Um, here is uh, Loughborough, for those who don't know, you don't know where it is in the UK, around the middle, very central, um, it's a big sports university. Um, I was a student there back in the 80s, unbelievably, uh, and, and never left. Um, but I have had uh, time away working in um, uh, professional sport. I worked in professional football uh, for two, two, two seasons um, in the Midlands, at the Midlands club that got promoted last, last season back up. Um, to the Premier League, and then I worked with their academy for under 10 years um, alongside my university work. And I also then worked within British Tennis as well as their lead psychologist in London with the players between sort of 15 to 19 years of age, um, both on kind of part-time bases whilst I was working as a scientist <coughs> practitioner with my own university. And now I, I, I work within tennis uh, as a consultant with coaches, but I also do a lot of work with parents, which I'll share with you, and, and a lot of supervision and management of young psychologists in professional soccer clubs, of which we have two um, uh, major ones in the middle that we, that we employ sports psychologists within at, at, in the youth <coughs> academy. Um, in terms of the journey of today's presentation, I guess I just want to walk you through a story or you know, my perceptions of, I think, what's really important with respect to uh, the growth and development of, of uh, young people through coaching, through coaches and parents. Um, it's mainly to inspire you even more because obviously I'm talking to people who are already understand the importance of, of psychological growth in young people. I'm already, I, you know, you're a, I'm preaching to the converted here. So it's about inspiring coaches and organisations towards the processes, the things that you can do to support the development of, of young people. Um, I want to really position coaches and parents as really key stakeholders, collaborators together, um, talking around some of the other present presentations that have reinforced the importance of bringing parents on board within organisation-led development and support strategies. And that does mean investment, investment from organisations in this space to make the science work, because the science of... of the psychosocial development of young people through sport is already there. We, we're doing more of it, but it, the, the science is ahead of the practice in terms of the way in which we actually use the science, um, particularly <laughs> below talent development level and to community level sport. Um, and I want to offer a persuasive argument as well for the role <coughs> of sports psychology and sports psychologists. And I know Hafren has a master's degree in sports science that she teaches on here, and there are people who do psychology and sports psychology within Iceland, but um, there's, a, there's, a, there's roles for sports psychologists part-time to try to um, begin to support coaches in youth environments and actually try to accelerate their learning and the children's outcomes, as well as obviously mitigate against negative uh, safeguarding and player welfare or athlete welfare issues. Uh, for sure in terms of the abuse aspect. Um, so um, I always uh, kick off actually a parent education with this particular slide because I always try to hit the parents early in the work that I do. Um, 
the athlete journey is not the only journey uh, that a young person will take. Um, I'll come back to the values and beliefs on the side in a second, but I think the one thing that I've always tried to conceptualise in my own mind as a sports psychologist, working in a, a youth sport environment, and we're talking here maybe particularly when a child's into competitive sport, moving up the levels, is that um, it's about mastering the known demands of the sport. So sport will impose demands on a young person in terms of the technical, physical, but also the psychological and social um, demands. What the demands that are placed upon an under nines player will be very different from the demands placed upon an under 14s player, for example. Later on for adolescence, they might have to cope with injury, for example, which is a psychological skill that we hope doesn't happen to an under nine um, uh, player. So there'll be the importance of employing, you know, the, the general sports psychology techniques, you know, the goal setting, imagery, self-talk, relaxation, coping skills. Um, they, they are there to try to meet the known demands of the sport. Um, but whilst that's happening at a more performance level or a talent development level, um, and also instrumental psychological skills, um, which we hope then transfer into life skills, there's also a child developing as well. <clears throat> the middle layer here is the fact that, you know, from a biopsychosocial point of view, children are going through childhood into adolescence, they're in individuating away from parents, they're trying to form their own identity. There's a lot going on in adolescence, and actually, the best thing that environments can do is to try to understand and support that and help them through sport to develop these life skills and psychosocial skills almost by being part of the community of sport. Um, and that that goes alongside the mental <coughs> skills side of the coin as well. And that's particularly important and particularly important when, um, in my own experience, having worked in soccer academies where a child's given you know, 10 years by the time they get to 16 years of age already sometimes, and then get released to an academy. There's a responsibility on that academy to have, have provided a psychosocial return on the child's investment in that, in that sport. And, and what are we leaving the children with when they exit from that academy? Well, the best thing we can leave them with is a, is a fantastic developmental experience and life skills, irrespective necessarily of what level of football um, they've actually, they actually make. And I think that if you take care of the middle and the bottom layer well and congruently, um, then you have a better opportunity to give a child a quality sport experience. If you think about a quality sport experience or a fun-based sport experience, it probably is one which is, com is comprised of those, those, those aspects, that it's, it is enjoyable, it is challenging, there is support available for that challenge, and it's one which is um, characterised by cons more consistent levels of mental and emotional well-being. Now, <clears throat> outside the values and beliefs, uh, those, that's what parents and coaches and organisations need to do. They need to value the importance of the middle and the bottom layer and actually see its importance. Um, and they need to believe, therefore, in actual investment of time and effort to actually help the child. So, I don't believe that without coaches and, and parents really valuing and believing and investing in the strategies in the middle and the bottom layer, are we going to optimise those layers to help the top, top outcome? So there has to be some degree of investment, some degree of, of inspiration here. Um, I, I had an um, opportunity working in professional soccer a number of years ago now. This was a 17-year-old. I, uh, I, I worked with, and this is one of the quotes in one of our in intake sessions that I did, which was, I get so nervous every time I get the ball because I know if I screw up, he'll have a go from the dugout, all the mates hear it, and the subs. I want to take on the best option for the team, try to develop my skill, but I'm mostly not taking the safe option because I'm not allowed to fail. It's difficult and frustrating to explain the mixed messages, the uncertainty, and his lack of consistency Encouraging you one day, hammering you the next. It's just an un inconsistent, uncertain relationship. <coughs> and players shouldn't carry the burden of thoughts about this onto the pitch when they already have their work cut out playing the opposition. So in sports psych, there's already so many different concepts emerging from like a, a narrative 
um, you know, like that, from anxiety, fear of failure, definitely peer, pre or peer, peer dynamics, coach-athlete relationship in particular uh, there. So we know there's children who do struggle from a coach-athlete relationship point of view, and it affects them psychologically. We also know that parents struggle as well. Um, this was some studies that I did with one of my former PhD students looking at, at parenting experiences in, uh, in, in youth soccer, really trying to spend some time with the parents, understanding some of their stresses. And one of the quotes was, uh, I felt it upset me more than it probably upset him, in that somebody else had had to tell me that your son's not enjoying it, and that was his granddad. My dad pulled me to one side and said, do you know how unhappy your lad is? And I've just been on the crest of a wave thinking, oh, he's enjoying it. He's going to Academy X and Academy Y. And I'm thinking he's loving it. But then when he's going to his grandparents in the week and saying, I don't want this. I don't like this. I don't like that. When I found out that I felt a bit of a failure, to be honest, as a dad, that I've not recognized it. And it upset me that he's not able to come to me in there. So I encourage anyone to go and read those papers because some really fantastic emotional quotes that parents share about their parent-child relationship um, in, in soccer. But parents need support and parents need knowledge, which I know is something that has been already shared today. Now, back in 2004, this was, when I was working in a professional soccer academy, um, basically my role was to try to, uh, as an academy psychologist, build a psychological environment within the club. Um, and the way I did this was working through the coaches. Uh, I did work with the parents and the players after the coaches, um, but it was about building coaching efficacy, which was coaching confidence, actually helping coaches have better knowledge of psychology and social uh, skills or the ways in which they could help communication skills in kids. So I want to share the, some of that, that brief work with you and those individuals who want to read more about that stuff, obviously you could go to the website and, and, and look at the book. Um, but it really was about creating a psychologically informed environment. Um, and that started with psychology having a really valued identity. It had to be uh, visible in the club and, 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 and valued. In the same way, for example, as strength and conditioning coaching is and physical conditioning is. Because, you know, that is valued. It's very measurable. You know, if you've improved on your bleep test or your yo-yo test, we can do one more press-up. Um, it's very visible. So there's no reason why you shouldn't be working on psychology in the same way as you were work working on your strength and conditioning in there. But it had to have an identity with really identifiable qualities underpinned by behaviours. And for me... As a young, younger psychologist then, it was around trying to educate and support and develop an environment which reflected a high quality of motivation, a high quality of mastery orientation, high quality of improvement-based um, dispositions and learning-based uh, work, interpersonal skills, attentional and emotional control skills, leadership and character-based um, competencies. So those are some of the things that we really focused on. Um, but it had to be presented in a common language. So it was about being accessible to coaches, accessible to everybody, so everybody got it. And at that particular stage, sports psychology still had a bit of a stigma attached to it, so I was having to fight a little bit against the term psychology, when for me, these were basic values and basic concepts which uh, should be you know, hanging off the doors or hanging off the pitch, um, you know, whenever you walked onto it. And it was explicit, as Dan said, it was very intentional. Um, kids might develop implicitly, but for me, it was about working with the coaches in a very intentional way, trying to improve knowledge and literacy in this area, to become more psychologically literate. So kids understood um, what emotional control was, and they began to understand and became more emotionally aware, and it was a, uh, not just physical literacy, it was a psychological literacy. Um, and it also had to have a development structure and accountability as well to it. So when, when the academy was having its player reviews every six weeks or two months, 
and the individual play development plans were coming out, psychology was in there and it had to have a framework. So it gave the coach and the player a chance to discuss or the, at least the coach be able to educate and support the child around the ways in which they saw the child's behaviour from a psychosocial point of view. And then obviously set goals, work together with the player until the next development plan type thing. And that's where we, we came, that's where I came up with the five C's at the time, because those were the most simplest ways of getting those particular things across um, in, in the club itself and actually base, basically trying to have a footprint, which I'll come to in a second. Now, um, this is simple stuff, okay? We're, to, we're, we're, drawing, we're drawing concepts from massive theories in psychology, motivational theories, attentional theories, emotional intelligence-based work, but we're trying to make it more accessible and user-friendly. There's a lot of theories in sports psychology. Some, I think, are too, too theoretical and not necessarily going to hit the ground at the, at the cold face. Because when I look at it, I just think that human behavior is really linked to how we respond in four different areas to uh, events that happen to us. So if you think about uh, a child in sport, um, sport will challenge their motivational responses in terms of whether they maintain effort or withdraw effort, whether they keep trying hard or not trying hard, whether they'll try a new skill out that challenges them or they won't. Uh, it'll challenge them in terms of their attention and where their attention's placed on the next pitch, thinking about the homework, thinking about other things. Uh, emotional responses, it will challenge their interpersonal responses, the way they interact with their coach, the way they interact with their teammate. These are all things that make up basically, a, a, in many, many respects, a performance state or a psychological state. Um, there. So we need to break it down and just try to help kids understand and parents understand that, you know, look, we're basically working on these four table legs. These are four table legs. They're going to make up a performance state. Um, we want to try to ensure that we're developing responses in these four areas which challenge the demand of the sport, which meet the demand of the sport, and which also help them in life in life skills and life context. Because if you think about the five C's in your own lives, even think about a meeting, going to a, a meeting at your, your organization. What is a good five C's meeting? What kind of behaviors are going to lead to a great productive meeting at work? What is it about you? What are the me factors that make it a good meeting? What is it about you factors that make it a good meeting? What is it about the us factors that make it a good re meeting? You know, well, you've got to be motivated and want to learn from, from the meeting. So that commitment is important. You want to have people on there uh, actually looking at you with making eye contact with you when you actually talk to them or when, you know, they're talking to you. So you want to have a degree of communication and concentration skills. You don't want the person to be on their iPad or their phone tapping away, which happens in every meeting. Every meeting, you've got somebody who's not engaged because they're on their phone, they're on their iPad. That's not good 5C behavior if you want a productive meeting. It really isn't. You know? so, so there's things like that which are kind of really important, which transfer into life domains, not just in, in, football, in football domains. And so you've then got a chance of kind of being the mouse against the elephant in sport, that sport will pu push these demands on kids in different settings, but actually they've got the coping skills because we're working, we're working on each pillar kind of bit by bit because we're working on the behaviours that we feel are important that kids can understand they're able to work on. Now, we, 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 can, we get access to this with kids by using playing cards in, the, in a project myself and Hafrin have got with a football club here. Um, you know, using playing cards and, and allowing the kids to talk about the five C's or using the wall of words with coaches because we know that um, if you want to convince coaches around the fact they're using psychology all the time, you just need to listen to them talk or listen to them share a talk discussion about a player um, because everything they talk about is relatively psychological um, there into the five C's. 
But more importantly, it's just an accessible framework. It, it's just a framework to, to, to start a conversation off about five key areas which we know are going to be pretty important in terms of the psychological growth of that individual. Now, we, 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 we engage the pedagogy with this, which comes back to, to Dan's point, um, and, and, and um, obviously some of the other speakers around the pedagogy of actually helping coaches to coach in the five C's way or coach psychology. And we come up with progress as a framework um, which was uh, there to try to help coaches develop a, a psychological return for the player on the session they were in. So if you wanted to promote, for example, communication skills, well, we actually had the dressing room zone where we'd start out about five minutes on communication and get kids to talk about what, well, what does good communication look like? When you watch a, a match on the Saturday in professional players, what, how do they show good communication? What do you think imagine, what do you think happens in the dressing room beforehand in terms of the way that players interact with each other in terms of communication? Um, so getting, promoting the importance of the C and the behaviours and then getting kids to talk about it and using role models um, around that set, start to set the scene. And then you begin to provide kids with ownership of their own learning, tries to give them, try to get them to set particular tasks and particular goals that are within the coaching session itself but which are there to try to prime and shape that particular behaviour. Um, and then, of course, the more reinforcement side of, of the of progress is praising the C when you, the coach praising the C when you see it, uh, empowering peer support, so empowering teammates to support teammates when they see a particular behaviour, and then praising the peer for praising the peer. So supporting the supporter, you know, Great job, well done for praising Dan Urban. Um, and finally, reflection at the end, self-review and responsiveness. So you tail the session down with what the learning's been and get monitors or get people or peers and kids to get together to reflect on the learning a little bit. Now that to me is a, a mastery-oriented climate, but it's not necessarily just focusing on high quality of motivation in the kids, it's actually focusing on a climate which creates different qualities rather than just the motivation. It helps maybe with their emotional control, helps with their communication skills, helps with their body language, like that. Let me give you a quick example, and I'm hoping this plays. It's not. No. My sound's not on again. Let me stop it. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's definitely a switch there with the sound. Um, the man at the top, he, he told me where it is. Microphones. Oh, oh. <coughs> no. Try now. Thank you. 
This is a commitment which we were talking about all day over here. Royal Carol, the commitment to do. So, how can you now go and change? I know somebody's already done it, so you might give us some answers. How have you changed that session to make it even more challenging for you? For you to become more committed to getting better at this practice. Yeah? Um, what did you do? We've got two goals. Two goals, yeah. So, that it's really much harder for the defender because if he gets killed, or you got to try, then he might go for the small goal. Yeah. So that means you've got to defend the small goal. Yeah. But if he goes for the big goal, we've got to watch out. Do you get different points for scoring? Yeah, yeah. Two points for the small goal. Because that's tougher, one point. I like that. It's a great idea, Tom. The when the defender is defending, yeah. um, he can't get to the attacker, he can't get to the attacker. So that's a reward. So if you stay on the ball for 10 seconds, your reward is your mate comes and helps you. Would that happen in a football match? Yeah, so sometimes if you're the striker on your own in the attacking third and you get the ball, there's three defenders, what would that, would, would that, is that what might happen in the game if you hold on to it? You might, you might get your support. That's brilliant. I love that. That's great. Um, well, Adam Keenan and, and, uh, thought that um, if the defender wins the ball, yeah. the attacker... Um, he can find a big goal, but he only gets one point for that. But if the um, defender um, wins the ball, we put up this cone here, yeah. this little cone here. This yeah, oh, that one, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. For, yeah. Yeah, and if he hits that, he gets two points. That's tough, though, isn't it, to hit that? So that's, a really, that, that's improving. What's he improving on, that's then? Accuracy, yeah. Accuracy yeah. and passing. So, but that's great, because you're willing to, to really try that. It's really good I stuff. Want you, on want you to go back now. Tom and I want you to go back now and really challenge this commitment level. How far can you? T where's your commitment levels at the moment in these games? Who can you can, can you get as high as possible? So who can go out and change your session a little bit and make it that little bit tougher? Can you do that? Uh, can you demonstrate that? Hopefully, you heard a bit of that um, with the coaching staff. Just We're also linking this to commitment. Promoting and okay, hang on a sec. Where's my screen go? <laughs> He's coming.
Okay. Right, okay. I've suddenly got subtitles, anyway. Okay, so um, just in terms of, of um, that being an example of how we used to work with coaches uh, just to educate them about HC and get, give them ideas around the coaching strategies that they could actually use to uh, develop that particular C within a session it, itself. One of the key features of all of that, it, it was basically focused around the coach just within training sessions. So um, for me, there was an importance around trying to ensure that we were um, uh, developing the five Cs and trying to create much more of a behavioral approach uh, in all the other contexts of, of the environment itself, not just in training sessions themselves. And of course, not just having players who were looking after their own behaviours and their performances on pitch, but more importantly, working with parents and coaches to understand how they could behave in ways which supported the five Cs or supported particular behaviours that have been set and worked on with the club. So, um, as an example to that, one of the things that um, we used to do this is a, a picture, a few years old now, because a few of those guys have left Leicester City Football Club um, in recent years. Um, but obviously trying to pull together some of the promotion and use the physical geography of the academy and the first team environment to pull together uh, the 5C standards that coaches were working on with players and so parents could see exactly the types of things <coughs> that uh, they were looking for in terms of their development. Um, in terms of leaving a, a footprint um, behind. Um, we also used a lot of little, little ideas with the under nines, under tens around certification and little ways in which they could actually demonstrate um, improvements and maintain particular behaviours awarded by the coach and by supported by the parents in terms of allowing the child to collect the stickers or collect the certificates. Um, one of the things that obviously became important was actually getting kids' voice and actually getting them to to share with the coach and share with the sports psychologist the type of uh, ratings or progress they'd made in particular behaviours over the course of maybe four to eight weeks um, and, uh, and using the perception of the coach with also the perception of the player uh, as part of a profiling and conversational tool as well. And here you see, here you see in, in slightly um, um, it's faded um, terms a little exercise we did with the, uh, with the players where most of the players here in the faded feel they are much better at the five C's or behaviours than the coaches felt the players were. So there was a discrepancy there between um, you know, coach and player perception, which is important to understand and important to explore. Because obviously, obviously you want to have the coach and the player on the same page in terms of where their development is going. Um, but we didn't use a Likert scale on this one. We actually tried to use the example of Champions League level, Premier League level, Championship level, non-league level, in terms of giving players a bit of a benchmark to, 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 to sort of uh, rate themselves against. And here's something from tennis that I used to do with the National Academy players where I would have some time with them and they would be able to sit down and reflect on the type of behaviours that they were looking forward to in the next month. Because uh, they didn't have much time with players as a psychologist when I was there. But when I did make the time, it was trying to get them to work with me over the course of a month on particular areas that became kind of target areas for us to, to work on alongside working and reinforcing it with the coach. Um, there. So that's just one example. Um, I just want to finish by moving into a final section on um, parents. Uh, it's nice to hear people wanting to work with parents um, rather than deal with parents. Um, I often hear that, that word used, and I don't like the verb deal with. Um, parents are really st our stakeholders, they're resources for us. Of course, they play massive roles in terms of provider, interpreter, and role model for their child. And we should really work on, and the work I do in British tennis is mainly based around helping them to understand their massively important role, not just as a provider, but particularly as an interpreter in terms of the language they use with their child before and during and after, after matches. The interpreter piece is really important. 
And parent support around that language is part of a, a key sports psychologist role in my, in my area, as well as obviously role modeling behavior. Um, it's evolved over the years. For those of you who aren't aware of sport parenting science, as it were, um, it's moved, I think it's moved some way from being problem focused, that parents are problems, to more empathic and support focused. It acknowledges the complexities of the, of the uh, parent-child relationship and the different family configurations that emerge now. Um, but there's still a tendency to treat parents in a vacuum, almost as if they're without a culture or a system socialising them around them, acknowledging that some parents behave because of the culture and the system they're in, like that. Um, and one of the main weaknesses, actually, is... We don't have many support programs which actually put parent and coach together. You know, most of the parent education work that's been done, that's been published, that I've published in the last five to ten years, has actually been we'll support the parents and give them information a bit about how to work with a coach, but it's not working with a coach um, in terms of a coach collaboration or parent coach relationship building. It hasn't really got into that. Um, but hopefully, the kind of work we're doing is going in the right, right direction. And obviously, it helps improve parents. And obviously, some of you will remember Christophe Fobia, the French tennis father who was, who was jailed for, for manslaughter because he drugged his son's opponents with Temesta, drugged his water bottles, drugged his, the son's opponent's water bottles. And, and um, a French school teacher playing his son in a match uh, fainted in a match, pulled out the match, drove home, hit a tree and was killed. And so he got charged with manslaughter because they found Temesta in his system. He's been spiking his drinks there. Um, so we have a lot of work to do with respect to nurturing sport parent expertise. But in the same way as we're responsible for coach education and helping coaching expertise in terms of young people, why aren't, we, why aren't we doing the same thing with parents? You know, they're a massive stakeholder. They spend more time probably in some cases with the child than the coach does. So there should be an equal role in terms of modules on, modules on these areas. You know, helping parents to facilitate child-appropriate opportunities when they're young. Helping parents to engage in an autonomous, supportive parenting style in sport. Helping them to understand the pathway and the organisational and developmental demands, and helping their emotional and self-regulation skills and the impact that has on their child and on their relationships with officials, with other parents, with coaches um, like that. And also helping them to adapt to changes in involvement because as children go through transitions, parents go through transitions too. And so you have to help parents to deal with the transition rather than just helping athletes to deal with a transition like that. So those are whole massive areas of work to do with parents. Uh, and it's really the role of a sports psych to do that with the parents in an organisation working alongside a coach. So there isn't any other way of putting it. Um, there's two papers to put on your radar to, to read um, in terms of strategies for supporting kids in this one workshop intervention work that I did with the LTA for four years. Um, with the psychosocial strategies one, we, we, we interviewed all the parents who'd been part of the Premier League Academy that, where we'd integrated the five C's over the past seven years. And we interviewed them about now the roles that they played with their children in reinforcing the five C's and reinforcing behaviours from the education and support we'd given them with the coach. And these were the types of uh, themes that emerged from that research that parents talked about in terms of establishing expectations and tailoring their feedback to their child, modeling the five C's at home, being more autonomous supportive, supporting the coach's messages, uh, using technology for reinforcement and assuring their extended family and grandparents understood what was being worked on, um, you know, like that. And one quote here just talks about a parent who says, his son was taken off after 70 minutes, 
and uh, he walked straight past the coach who was trying to give him a high five and he walked straight past him and the parent says, in the car, I said to him, I'm disappointed that the child said, but I played well. I know, I know you played well, but that's communication behaviour at the end when you walk straight past the coach who was trying to give you a high five. I'll show you on Huddle, on the performance analysis video, Huddle. You can be there, you look at it and you'll say, that's not good, I think the video is brilliant be able to get, get over some of those things. Um, for those of you interested in tennis parenting or parents, please take a look at the website, the parents area of the LTA, um, because on there you'll see the parent support program that we've pulled together for that governing body. Uh, we have a what we call an optimal competition parenting workshop, which is a workshop that I deliver every month to parents on, as a webinar for two hours, and we look at the importance of tennis for life we look at pre-competition, during competition and post-competition support. Uh, and that leads into a 5Cs workshop as a second webinar, a little booklet um, that they also um, get as well, which anyone can download off the website like that. Um, just in closing, I just wanted to reinforce that this is like a really important psychosocial journey for coaches and parents in, in, um, in sport. And it, and it begins, I think, in three phases, starting with the knowing phase, as I would refer to it. That helping uh, coaches to share what they know about psychosocial behaviour with the players or with the athletes they work with. So knowing is about helping the coaches to, bring, to gain knowledge, but helping them to begin to transfer that knowledge through their coaching sessions to children or to, to adolescents. Now, when they've gone through that, the knowing phase becomes the growing phase, whereby now you have young people through their goal setting and the work they do with their peers working together more on trying to demonstrate, cultivate, nurture these types of psychosocial skills and these beginnings of life skills that Dan's talked about into their normal sporting um, context without the coach being present necessarily because there's a responsibility on the adolescents now. And then the showing phase is actually where we want to get to, which is Dan's point around life skills, that they're able to show some of these same skills within other contexts in life. But I think a community in sport, Icelandic sport or Scandinavian sport or wherever you are, has a responsibility for helping them with the knowing and growing phase so they can start showing um, some of these qualities in other, in other areas of their life. Thanks a lot, and I uh, hope you have a great lunch. And thanks a lot.